So, hi, I'm Mike Coleman. Um, I am a developer advocate at a company called Sysdig. We were the original creators of Falco, and uh, we have since donated it to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So I'm going to uh, take you through um, some slides, and then we're going to do some demos, and we're going to go. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, and share screen, come over here, share, and then not this tab, this one. All right. Um, okay, cool. So uh, I introduced myself. So before joining Sysdig earlier this year, I was at Google. Before Google, I was at AWS. I was at Docker. I was at VMware. I was at Microsoft. So I've been at a bunch of different places. I've been doing virtualization and containers for about 15 years. Um, first at VMware and then over to Docker, right when containers started really taking off. And then um, at Google as well, I was on the GKE uh, team, the Google Kubernetes engine team, and then here at Sysdig, um, working on container security and Kubernetes security. So um, this, we're scheduled to run about two hours. Uh, you can find that bit.ly right there will take you to the slides. Um, the slides that you will download are slightly different from mine, but they are, you know, 90% the same. Um, we're going to do uh, lecture, lab, lecture, lab, lecture, lab, lecture. So there are sort of four chunks of lecture with three labs breaking that up. The labs take anywhere from five to 10, 15 minutes, depending on um, your pace. Um, and I'll give you the link to the labs when we get to that slide. Uh, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna set some context because I don't know everybody's background. So we are gonna spend some time on uh, you know setting context. We are also then we're gonna talk about the Falco engine. We'll talk about the Falco ecosystem, and then we will wrap up with some additional resources for you to be able to um, check out. So let's take a history lesson and go way back to when I first started my career uh, many years ago. Right. I used to work on physical servers, right? And and not even in a data center, right? I worked for Intel at the time, and we used to put our servers under tables and in closets and you know, all kinds of random places. And even though I worked for Intel, the the at that point, the only company really making uh chips, you know, CPUs for for personal computers and 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 x86 servers, it would take us months to get them in. Right. And they would we would order them and then they would get manufactured and then it would take months to come in. And then if one of them failed, it was really hard for us to kind of replicate that server and replace it. We were supposed to write everything down, but we didn't necessarily always do that. Um, so it was really hard to kind of manage them. Um, and the other part of it, too, is because of the way applications interact, as many of you probably know, we couldn't install multiple applications on one server. We would have an email server, we would have a web server, we would have a database server, and those servers wouldn't really be fully utilized, right? We'd order a standard size server because that made it easier for us, but on average, the utilization was probably around 20 to 30% on those machines. So we were wasting thousands and thousands of dollars. So sometime in the early 2000s over at Stanford, um, a couple of a married couple, Diane and Mendel Mendelbaum, uh, Diane Green and her husband, they they went and they they kind of had this research project. And they they kind of popularized x86 virtualization, right? The idea that I'm going to take everything that's in hardware and I'm going to replicate it in a software blob, right? Using a thing called a hypervisor. So they you could take now your physical servers and you could wrap them into a virtual machine. And you could deploy them. This says days, but honestly, it was like minutes and hours to stand up a new virtual machine, as long as you had the physical resources to back it up. Um, and now on a physical piece of hardware, I could run three servers. And where I was having, you know, 20% utilization before, I could now have 60 or 70% utilization. Um, I was reducing my footprint. By this time, we were in data centers. I was re reducing my data center footprint. I was... Um, I was increasing my utilization, you know, all my costs were going down. Um, and, you know, the uh, the one issue with virtualization is that when you have to package these things up, you have the kernel is replicated for every uh, virtual machine, 
right? So on a given machine, you might be running three instances of the kernel, which means you were booting up a whole operating system every time you needed to use it. And there was no real isolation between the application and the kernel because they were all running together, right? On the same machine. So around 2012 or so, a company gets formed called Dot Cloud, and they're going to be a platform as a service. They're going to be like Heroku. And around 2013 or so, they realize maybe we're not going to be successful in this market, but we've built some cool technology. Let's share it with the world. So Solomon Hikes goes on stage and he demos for the first time at PyCon Docker. And that leads us to the container revolution, right? So containers have a lot of the real interesting benefits of virtual machines, but they, they have some distinct advantages, right? So first of all, in a container, you don't share, you don't have your own kernel. A container is an isolated Linux process, right? Or Windows. It runs on Windows as well. Um, and rather than a, a hypervisor, you may or may not have a hypervisor. In our diagram here, we do, but we don't necessarily have to, right? We could just have bare metal with uh, an, uh, a base operating system and a container runtime and then a bunch of, of containers. And containers are much smaller than VMs typically, right? We're talking going from 10 gigabytes down to, in some cases, less than 100 megabytes, massive reduction. Um, because they share the kernel and their process, they take as long to start up as it does for a process to instantiate. So they can start up in a matter of seconds versus uh, minutes for a virtual machine, which makes them great for scale out, right? If you, need to, if you need to dynamically scale a workload, it's much more efficient to do it in a container than it is to do in a virtual machine. Matter of fact, with a virtual machine, by the time you scale up to 10 instances, that peak may have passed, right? That you were scaling up for. Containers fix that, um, and you know they're they're much more resource efficient because they can they don't rep they don't re they they're not nearly as redundant, right? They don't replicate the kernel. They actually do a lot of stuff under the covers to reduce storage footprint as well with things like layers and layering and whatnot. And we'll get into that a little bit later, but um, and you know at the end of the day, containers were designed to solve one problem. And that one problem was, it doesn't work on my machine. So a developer would build something, they would package it up, right? They're executable. They would ship it over. Somebody would test it. It would work. They'd put it in production and it wouldn't work, right? Because underneath the executable was this big collection of um, libraries and drivers and all this other stuff that had to be exactly the same through all these environments. And that was really, really hard to do. Um, and so um, that is what containers gave us right i can build something on my macbook for docker with docker for desktop i can run that on a uh, on a linux machine in a vm i could run it on a linux machine in bare metal i could put it into a cloud provider on running on ecs or aks or or um eks all of those things so that's what containers brought us uh, made it much easier to package up applications and they were much smaller which also let us go from this idea of like well in my virtual machine, I'm just going to put all of my components. I'm going to put my database, my web server, and everything's going to go on one machine. And, and I'm just going to package it up that way to now, not only am I breaking out like the major components, like, oh, my database is over here. My web server is over here. I'm actually taking my executable and I'm breaking that up as well. And I'm like, here's my payment service, and here's my login service, and here's my logging service, and here's my catalog lookup service. That gave rise to this idea of microservices. So this idea that you could take an application and break it down into these smaller components that basically, as long as you expose an API interface for both components, they could talk to each other. And so developers could write in whatever language they wanted into. They let they were able to break things up and, and reuse components across applications. Um, they allowed for um, great scaling so if you had a web front end in a container, super easy to scale the web front end out, um, right? And so um, basically they're, they're small nature, they're easy to, to replicate, being able to run them across environments, loosely coupled, a great way of developing new applications. The issue became, right, that now I used to have this application, right? And now I've broken that down into 10 microservices. And, oh, by the way, I need to scale those microservices appropriately. So maybe I'm running 
a thousand web front end containers on a busy shopping day for my e-commerce site. All of a sudden, when I used to have maybe two or three VMs that comprise my application, I now have dozens, hundreds, thousands of containers. That got really difficult to manage. So that led us to Kubernetes. And with Kubernetes, this allows us, you know, this came from Google. It was an internal system called Borg. Um, they were like, well, we've done, you know, they saw Docker and they're like, well, that's great. They've made containers easy for people to use. We still got to figure out, out a way to manage them. And they donated Kubernetes to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation as a way of managing containers. And that's what Kubernetes does at the most basic level. It allows you to de define how you want your application to run. And then you put it on this system and Kubernetes uh, aggregates all the compute resources, right? So you could have a cluster of 15 machines and Kubernetes sees it, you know, you see it as one virtual thing with Kubernetes placing containers, making sure that they're running. If one of them fails, it restarts them, right? If you need to scale up, it'll scale up. If you need to scale down, it'll scale down. All of those things are, are what Kubernetes does. And so that was, um, that's what we did, right? And as mentioned, Kubernetes was donated to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. That is an organization that ensures that um, open source projects aimed at cloud native computing workloads or use cases are um, have good governance. They have good governance. They meet certain standards for you know security and documentation and and community and all of these things. And um, projects in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation go from sandbox, which is experimental, to incubated, which is you know sort of like uh, a release candidate, not quite completely finished, but solidly there. You could run it in production. Um, there may be some things that can be better with documentation or some of these things to graduate it, right? And so that's what the CNCF does. So I use the term cloud native. Cloud native is like kind of like you could almost conflate cloud native with microservices, right? It's it's about running resources in cloud computing environments. And I don't love the term cloud, but think of cloud as both being a private cloud on-prem in a data center and a public cloud like Azure or Amazon Web Services or um, or even Google Cloud Platform, any of those, right? Um, it's a it's a way of building applications where you assume everything's going to fail, and you um, and you and you build systems in to to kind of address that. Um, it's using you know we talk a lot about cloud native technologies, but this idea of techniques is even maybe more important because what you do in in a cloud native environment is not the same thing you did in your traditional data center. You do not, as a best practice, you do not patch running containers, right? You rebuild them and redeploy them. So there, there isn't this idea of like a large, massive patch deployments thing that you need to do where you had to go through before and all your VMs and like run an update on all of them and get them all patched up to the same level. Here, you just patch your base container image. Containers are ephemeral. You destroy all the old ones, you roll the new ones out. Um, you do that with things like CI, CD pipelines, right? Continuous integration, continuous delivery. You manage your infrastructure with infrastructure of with uh, infrastructure as code, either using something proprietary like uh, CloudFormation on AWS or Terraform or Pulumi on, you know, open source. So, you know, these environments are rapidly changing. They're largely automated. They are, they're done. A lot of this is done with open source tooling, um, and that's kind of how we define cloud native, right? So that was the journey that application sort of went on. And I spend time on that because security was affected by all of those changes, right? And, and a lot of that stuff kind of, kind of comes through, right? So we talked about physical servers sitting in a room somewhere and we've got to protect them. And when you would talk about the, the, the core tenet of security sort of in this time frame was around firewalls, right? What we were thinking about was all the bad stuff is typically going to happen from the outside. And if we can keep people from getting into our, into our environment, we're largely safe, right? Which is kind of like how you think about maybe your house or your apartment, your, your domicile where you live. You're like, I lock all my doors and windows because really the threat that I might experience as someone from the outside. It's not within my own family, typically, 
Well, depends on how dysfunctional your family is, but anyway. So, um, so we build these walls and that's really great because we have this defined perimeter. Typically to the data center, you've got one or two network connections that come in. You are owning them. They're either dedicated lines or you've leased them or whatever, but there's this finite number of ways to get into that environment or there was. But now the cloud isn't like that anymore, right? The cloud, Internet of Things, all we've got network connected devices everywhere. My, I bought a new truck and my truck gets all of its updates over the air. Every month I get a software update for my truck, right? If you have a, an electric vehicle like a Tesla, I have an electric truck, that's right. But Tesla cars, same things, right? Even, even uh, normal cars. There isn't this idea of a well-defined perimeter. If you haven't ever done it and you want to have fun, go and stand up a EC2 instance on AWS with a public IP address and see how much traffic that IP address gets of people trying to hammer that IP and find a way into it, right? If you want to have fun, put your public credentials for AWS up on GitHub. Do not do this. Do The first one you can do, do not put your public your credentials up on AW, on GitHub. But if you were to do that, and I have done it uh, once, um, they're usually found in a matter of minutes. People are out there constantly looking for things, little mistakes that people have made to exploit them. And because there are so many more touch points, we store our, our code in GitHub, right? And, and sometimes it's in a public repository. And sometimes we forget to make a repo repository private. Right. And then we have the cloud environment and we've got our firewalls, but we've also got our IAM rules, identity and access management that define who can log in and who can't and how can one service talk to another. Right. All of these different layers open yourself up to, you know, this idea of unusual activity, but also innocent mistakes. Right. I didn't intentionally put my credentials up on. GitHub when I did it, right? It was a mistake. And so some people will say, well, you know, the greatest threat to any organization is coming from the inside by a disgruntled employee, right? Because they're already inside the firewall and, and they, you know, they have typically may have a lot of access. Well, yeah, they're dangerous, but they're also not as common as somebody like myself who just made a mistake, right? You're a system administrator and you're overworked or you're tired or you want to get home. And so you're just like, I'm just going to do this one. I know I'm not supposed to do this, but I'm going to do this thing, right? Or, you know, you unintentionally do something. And that really is kind of what you need to be looking for now. So if you don't have, I don't like this slide, I'm not going to present it. Um, so, so actually I will, because it's important for the next one. So if you start thinking about how these applications come together, right? And all of these different layers, I have to move this out of the way. Um, you can see here, Right, we've got workloads and we've got databases and we've got management services and networking and security. We're running workloads in containers or serverless. We're running them on hosts, right? We've got different cloud infrastructure, different cloud providers. All of this stuff now is happening in almost every environment, every enterprise environment. Most enterprises have more than one cloud provider. Most of them are using containerized applications alongside virtualized applications, along applications running in a data center, all of this has gotten immensely complex. And so to, you know, to help address those concerns with security, we have, you know, we haven't, but the industry has developed these things called cloud native application protection programs, platforms, and they're designed to go through the entire uh, ecosystem and look at like, okay, do I have vulnerabilities in the container images I just bought? Okay, are, do I have network policies in place? Are my, you know, are my firewall rules correct? Are my, you know, am I, am I doing the right um, isolation between virtual private clouds? Then, you know, have I set up these environments correctly? Do I have multi-factor authentication in place? Do I have, you know, cluster role bindings where I should just have a role binding in Kubernetes? Like all of these different, different things, right? Like, is my infrastructure's code, is it is it not only secured in the right source repository, but does it expose things that it shouldn't? Have I embedded secrets into my Terraform, for instance, rather than storing it as an, uh, a file somewhere else or an environment variable? So CNAPs do a lot of stuff, right? But they're sort of aimed at 
understanding, already knowing what the problem is going to be, right? So with runtime security, we're looking at behavior, right? So these other things are like, okay, did I configure this firewall right? Did I make sure that I had the right you know, policies in place? Am I blocking these things? Does my Do any of my applications have vulnerabilities? And all of that works really, really, really well until you put something into production, right? And some of the stuff actually, you know, of course, is working while the system is running. But if you think about something like vulnerability scanning, which is the idea that I have a, a database of, of uh, vulnerabilities and I have a library of container images or, or even like I'm building an application and I'm going through and I'm scanning all of the components to make sure these vulnerabilities don't show up. And that's great. You put that in production and you know that when you built it, when it came out of your CI CD pipeline, you knew that it was, there were no vulnerabilities in there that you cared about. Awesome. But what happens the next day? That application is running. There wasn't a vulnerability when you created it, but one was discovered after you deployed it. That's what runtime security does, right? It looks for those sort of those sort of anomalies. Um, and like we won't necessarily tell you you're running a vulnerability, but what we'll tell you is that somebody's doing something weird that might be indicative of them exploiting that vulnerability. So you you need runtime security on top of your CNAP. And you know, that is, um, you know, I kind of was talking about that. You know, if you talk to Gartner or you talk to any number of people, runtime security is absolutely critical for um, your, you know, to have a full complement of security um, capabilities. So we talked about the wall. And if the wall is fine, when you don't have to worry about people on the inside, what do you do? If somebody like, so you have a, a moat around your house, right? You have a wall around your house and you're like, okay, cool. But what happens if somebody gets over the wall or across the moat? Well, that's where you need a security camera, right? You need something to tell you what's going on in that moment, in that environment, right? And then you need that thing to tell you when there's a problem. And that is what we talk about when we talk about Falco, right? Falco is a security camera for your compute environments. It's looking in real time at what's going on and letting you know about it. So, and we can do that across the spectrum of the environment, right? So we talked about like a scene app needs to look at all of these different things. Well, we can help do that with runtime, you know, with runtime security um, in real time, right? So if some, excuse me, if somebody was to commit keys to GitHub, if somebody was not using multi-factor authentication when they logged in, if somebody was doing, um, misconfiguring your AWS environment, if they're running containers or they're running hosts, right? If they're running virtualized applications, any of that stuff, we can tell you from, from sort of source code through the operational process into the uh, you know, post-deployment um, environment as well with, with Falco. So it, you know some things we talked about, right? Like I mentioned the secret push to a public repository. Okay, well, we can detect that. That's not something you want to happen. Someone just created a privileged pod. A privileged pod is a pod that runs with a bunch of capabilities. And um, and if you were to escape out of that pod, um, you could potentially have disastrous results, right? And so there are times where you need privileged containers. For instance, Falco runs as a privileged container because it needs to have a lot of access to the to the underlying operating system in order to work. So in and of itself, starting a privileged container isn't bad, but you definitely don't want a lot of them and you definitely want to know exactly why they're happening. And that is um, what, you know, so Falco will say, look, hey, did you know that someone started a privileged container? Um, you know, we talked about multi-factor authentication. So whether it's looking at CloudTrail logs from AWS or whether it's monitoring Okta, we can look for those sort of suspicious behaviors where you know, hey, you know, you are you absolutely should not be logging into the AWS console unless you have multi-factor authentication enabled. And somebody just did. Or somebody looks like they may be just phishing with the multi-factor authentication on our system. So we can do that um, and that, you know, so there's some examples. So that's what Falco does. Falco is an open source Cloud Native Computing Foundation incubating project. We have applied for graduation. Um, that process is going right now, and and uh, 
you know, it's looking pretty good. So hopefully that'll happen for us in the not too distant future. Um, this slide says 50 million pools, but really, if you look at it across a bunch of different platforms, it's closer to 100 million downloads of Falco. Um, and I think we're up to like 6.3 thousand stars on GitHub. So it's used at a bunch of companies um, across the globe to secure their runtime environments. Um, and basically what it does at the most basic level is it takes, a, it takes input from various streams, it processes them uh, and looks at them and compares those streams to a rules library, and then it alerts you about suspicious activity. That, so that's right now, that's all you need to know. It takes an input, it looks at the input, and then it alerts you if there's a problem. So the alerts come through at the most basic level, they'll get logged out to the system and they look something like this, right? So this was like, hey, somebody just shelled into a container and you'll notice all the information you get. So that you get the, a notification, you get the username, the user ID, the container name, the container ID, what the process was that was, or you know, what shell was spawned, bash in this case, what was the command line they ran, bash in this case. Um, and yeah, all of that different stuff, um, the contain base container image, all of that. And you also get, you know, and, and in this case, so that's like someone shelled into a container. In this case, the next one, we're like specifically warning you that a specific executable was run. Netcat was run. You probably don't want to run Netcat in your containers. You certainly don't want somebody else starting it. Netcat allows you to pipe output into a network connection, which can be used for like a reverse shell. So we don't, you know, you don't want to see that. So again, you get a bunch of information with that, that there. So that's a couple of examples. You look a lot more at Falco output in a little bit, but that's kind of what you get. All right. So, and like I mentioned, you can deploy Falco on hosts. So even if I'm not using Kubernetes, if I just have a, a, a Linux machine, it only runs on Linux. If I have a Linux machine, either a VM or a physical machine, I can put Falco right on that. I can also run Falco in a container and I can run Falco on Kubernetes. So I can run it across a bunch of different environments. All right. So on your screen right there is the bit.ly for uh, the, um, let me see, are there any questions? Yeah, don't add your .env file. Yeah, yeah, you didn't add your .env file to get ignored. Yes. Um, is um, is Falco purely for, uh, why, I this I have this silly, there we go, okay. Is Falco purely for security purposes or does the rule library include troubleshooting? Um, it depends on how you define troubleshooting, right? So not like generic troubleshooting. Like if you're, if you're, if you've got a crash loop back off on your container, for instance, on Kubernetes, we're probably not going to be a lot of help troubleshooting that, right? But if if suspicious behavior is happening, we can help you root cause that and understand it. So in the traditional systems administrative perspective, it's not really like troubleshooting that way, but it does let you know when weird things are happening. Um, okay. All right. Thank you for those. Uh, all right. So. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm actually not going to stop my screen share. I'm going to go out of here. Um, and this again, hopefully you guys got the, um, got the, uh, URL here. What that's going to take you to is this instruct platform. We're going to ask you for some information about yourselves. Um, and once you do that, you can go ahead and do the lab. Um, I'm going to go through the lab right now for anybody else who doesn't want to do it or maybe doesn't have the ability to do it right now. I'm going to go ahead and run through it. If you don't want to hear me uh, talk through it, then uh, mute me. Okay. Um, can you show the link again? Yes, I can. Uh, yeah, there. that's a really good idea. I, I will put it in the chat. Thank you. That's a good idea. Let me do that. Um, so I'm used to doing this. This is the first one of these I've done virtually. So I'm used to doing them live. And so, um, yeah, usually I, I don't have the option of putting it in the chat. Uh, chat. And then we go here. There you go. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, Daniel, I uh, you have an issue with the lab at the end. Assessment didn't validate my custom rule. 
let me run through it and see if I get the same problem. Um, if, if you do the check and it doesn't work, you can always just skip it. All right, so there's the link in the chat. I'm gonna run through it and I'm gonna close the chat and we're gonna hit start. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna install Falco. And to do that, I need to install kernel headers. And the first thing I'll do is check to see if the kernel headers are already installed. We need the kernel headers because um, we have to compile the driver for specific versions of the kernel. And we need those headers to do that. Plus it helps us define system calls. So we're gonna come in here. I'm gonna install the Linux headers using apt-get. And you'll notice up here, it's like this uname-r. That is what's gonna tell us what uh, version of the headers we're installing. So our headers that we're installing are 513019 GCP. So we're running on Google Cloud on an AM60, AMD64 machine, right? So that's what that uname-r did. So if I go up and check again, the header should be installed and they are. So let me clear the screen. So now I'm gonna go ahead and use something called Helm to install Falco. And Falco can be installed in a number of different ways. The easiest way is using Helm, which is a package manager for Kubernetes. So what we've done in this step is we've gone out to what's called a, a Helm repository. And we've said, hey, here's where you get the Helm chart for Falco. Here's how you find it. And a Helm chart is just the instructions on how you actually install something. So if I hit clear, we'll come down, we'll install the chart and we'll copy this and we'll paste it. So we're gonna basically install Falco um, into a um, Kubernetes namespace called Falco. And we're going to uh, uh, set it up with the defaults, right? We're not, well, we did, we set the TTY to true. So we get, normally there's a slight delay from the time um, an event is, a, rules, a rule is matched to its output. But we uh, we have a we want to do that instantaneously for this lab. So um, now let's see. So this is showing me all the pods in the Falco namespace. Pods are a Kubernetes primitive um, that uh, that's where containers don't you don't run containers on Kubernetes. You run pods, and pods contain containers. Right, so you don't manage containers directly on Kubernetes. You manage these things called pods, and the pods manage the containers. So we are we have a pod called uh, Falco NDZ v4, and uh, we're going to run two of those, and they're both running. So now, if I look at the Falco logs, I should see everything is up and running, right? So we're using the default Fal Falco rules file. We're using the kernel module. I'll explain exactly what that is in a minute. And we're using system calls. And I'll explain exactly what that means in a minute too. So let's test it. I am gonna go onto the system here. And again, I'm just running on a, a Linux VM and I'm going to try to find the uh, private keys, right? So, um, so somebody got onto my system and they're looking for my private keys. That's kind of a weird thing to do. Like you necess wouldn't necessarily want people to do that. So, if I go and I look at the logs again, you can see the um, system call source, or excuse me, what we care about is this right here. So somebody was looking for private keys or passwords. It was the root user. This is the command they ran, the process ID of the, of the, the find. Um, it wasn't in a container because the container ID is host, right? So the, if I think it, uh, um, if it was a container, I'd actually have a container ID. But because I don't have a container ID um, here, that means I'm not on a I'm not in a container. I'm on I'm on the host. Um, so we're using you know um, we talked about that we're using the kernel module, and if we didn't want to use the kernel module, you could go into this Helm install and you could add a, a field called driver.kind. Um, I believe that's what it's called, something like that. Um, and that you could specify um, one of the other probes. So we do kernel modules, we do eBPF probes, and we have a modern eBPF probe. And I'll tell you what all that means in another lab or another few minutes. So let me see here in the chat. 
Um, the lab, it is in the, I pasted it in the chat, right? Yvonne, it, it should be in the message right above yours. Um, anyway, um, all right, so let me check this, make sure everything's working appropriately. Okay, so Daniel, I don't know what was going on with yours. Mine worked fine. Um, I have some issue at the, on that lab at the end assessment. Don't validate my custom rule. Um, did you do your own rule or? Yeah, so we're going to, I don't know, Daniel. Um, I'm not sure what's going on there. All right, I'm going to, I'm going to give you y'all uh, about three more minutes to finish up the lab. Um, actually two more minutes and then we will um, rejoin this. Can't see the link. Okay. Uh, maybe you joined after I pasted it. Uh, do, 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 do. Let me go here. And let me go back to the chat. Okay, there's the link to the lab. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to shorten your name to Vijay. I hope you don't mind because I don't want to butcher it. But thank you, Vijay, for pasting that. Um, all right. Yeah, let's uh, a couple more minutes. I'm going to I'm going to turn off my camera and run up and, and get a glass of water real fast. And I'll be back with you um, in the not too distant. Future. Actually, I'm not going to turn off my camera. I'm just going to get a glass of water and I'll be right back. Uh, feel free to take a break if you need it. Is Falco a SIEM tool? No, um, it is not. It's a it's a runtime security tool, right? SEIM is much more involved. It's involved with categorizing and capturing um, uh, events. So, yeah, it is not. Okay, all right. Let us, you know, if you didn't get the lab finished, that's okay. These labs will be available to you for twenty four hours. Um, so, if it um, so is it like EDR? It is like ED in that it does detection. It doesn't do response by itself, right? So um, the R in EDR is response. And as we're going to learn over the next couple of chapters, um, we don't natively do response. We give you tools to do the response, but we are not going to do remediation or response um, in and of itself with Falco. Um, Falco is about capturing images or capturing events, processing events and alerting you to the events. And then the next step would be like, well, what do I do with that, right? So we will talk about that, but um, it is not EDR. It's just detection. Um, okay, let me close this. Let me go here. Let me go here. Okay. All right, so the Falco engine. So how you just um, saw Falco in action, right? You saw me create an event the event was I was trying to find the private keys. And then you saw Falco capture that event. We didn't really see it capture it, but it captured it. And then it gave you an output telling you, hey, somebody did something nefarious. So by default, 
um, we work with Linux system calls. So anything that happens on a Linux system, it happens via a some system call. So if you were writing an app, like if you if you take a Linux command cat, right, which is which I believe is short from concatenate, or, or and, and and if you cat a file, and uh, that will dis that'll print it to the screen, right? So if I say cat file.txt, one of the system calls is going to be open file.txt. And then another system, there'll be multiple system calls that are like read the the file that I just opened and then write to standard output and then close the file and close standard output, right? So you would be using a read system call, a write system call, an open system call, and a closed system call. There's probably more in there, but those four system calls would have been used in that example. So we, we capture those system calls um, with Falco. Um, we also have a plugin architecture that lets you capture events from other sources. So Kubernetes audit logs, um, Okta logs, uh, AWS CloudTrail, Google Cloud Platform, GitHub, all of those things have a plugin. And that's how you can look for things like, did I push my public keys up to um, GitHub, right? That's how we can detect that. So what we mean by detection or, or you know, what, what I said here, process is two steps. There's enrichment and there's filtering. And these are backwards. It should actually be filter and enrichment. Um, and we'll talk about each of these uh, in more detail, but filter is basically comparing an event to a rule and deciding whether or not I need to do something with it. And enrichment is taking a bunch of system call information and formatting an output that makes sense, right? Like that you can understand. Um, like you wouldn't want to get something that said user one point user one three one two four seven uh, open file descriptor three. Like that wouldn't tell you anything. What you want to know is user Mike opened file, you know, IDSA underscore ID underscore RSA. You want to know the file name and you want to know the username so that it's easier for you to process in your brain. And then we want to send that output somewhere. By default, we can write out to standard out, syslog, and HTTPS and gRPC endpoints. Like there's plugins, there's something called Sidekick, which we'll talk about at the end, that extends the output. But but by default, that's what we do. So the example you just used, the example you just saw was capturing a system call. In this case, um, you know, it was probably the open, uh, you know, the, the, whatever it was for find, right? The However that system call broke down. Um, we caught that. We said, that's not something people should be doing. We enriched it with all the information about what file did they try to open? You know, who tried to open it? Um, all that kind of stuff. And then we wrote it to standard out. So, if you get a little bit more detailed into the components of Falco, Falco is actually a pretty, architecturally, it's a pretty simple application. There's a driver and then there's the, the um, Falco process, right? The Falco program, Falco executable. The driver sits in, in uh, and operates against the kernel. And it can either be a loadable kernel module or it can be an eBPF probe. And I'll explain what that means in a minute. And basically every system call that goes through the system, we look at, or we, we, we detect, and then we write it to a ring buffer um, if we care about it. We don't capture every system call, but there's ones that we do ca care about. We capture that and we put that on the ring buffer. Um, and a ring buffer is just a, an in-memory buffer. And it's, you know, you write one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, and the 11th one goes into one. Right. So as long as you're pulling stuff off the buffer faster than you're writing it, you don't have a problem. Right. Um, and and this operation here on the kernel space side is non-blocking. We just get the system call. We write it to the ring buffer and then we just worry about everything else next. Right. So capture it, write it. And then it gets pulled out of the ring buffer by the Falco executable, the Falco service running in user space. And that's where it goes in and it looks at like, you know, what we talked about those things like parsing and enrichment and matching. So like, do I care about this event? Yes or no. Do I have a rule? Uh, does it match? Yes, no, right? Okay, it did. And now I got to add a bunch of metadata to it. State engine and event enrichment go hand in hand. We'll talk about those in a second as we'll go and we'll dive into the rules. And then if you have an event that matches, you, you send an output, right? So um, there are, let me go back here real quick. 
there are three ways to interact and get the Linux kernel to do what you want it to do if it doesn't have that functionality naturally, right? So I need something that's going to take system calls and put them on a ring buffer, right? That's the functionality I need the kernel to do. And you can do that through three different mechanisms. The first is I could rewrite the kernel, right? I could go in, I could rewrite the kernel, I could put that functionality in there, and then I could take it and I could take it to the Linux Foundation or the new foundation or whoever's managing the Linux kernel. And I could try to get them to incorporate my changes into the Linux kernel. And then for two or three years, people will argue about it. They will tell me it's a bad idea. They'll tell me it's a good idea. They'll fight. And then ultimately they won't do it, right? Getting changes into the kernel, extremely difficult. So what they did a while back is they introduced this thing called a loadable kernel module. And a loadable kernel module is code that augments the kernel and allows the kernel to have custom capabilities. It doesn't affect everybody. It only affects people that load the kernel module, right? So we, what we did in our first lab is we used the kernel module. We loaded the kernel module for the specific version of the kernel that we talked about, right? And so we have these kernel drivers, these kernel module drivers for many, many, many different distributions and versions of the kernel and everything. And we have a bunch of pre-built ones. And if we don't have a pre-built one, we can try to build one for you, right? So that's what a kernel module does. Um, kernel modules are great. They can be amazing, but if they're written poorly, they can cause a lot of problems because they are running in the kernel. And that means that if something blows up, they take the kernel down, it's a bad deal. So they needed something a little bit safer. And that's where eBPF comes in. Now, eBPF is basically an extension of an older technology called uh, Berkeley packet filters, which were originally used to capture networking traffic, right? And do things like, you know, routing and route updates and packet analysis and all kinds of stuff. Somebody extended that and said, why don't we just do that for system calls as well? And so now you can do all kinds of things with eBPF, right? Um, and they basically do it... Um, you don't have to change the kernel source code. You don't have to use a kernel module. Use eBPF probes, and they are um, there's a, they have advantages over kernel modules in that the, they run sort of in a sandboxed environment. They have a just-in-time compiler that takes the C code. The probes are written in C. Sometimes they're wrapped in Python. There's Python wrappers around C code to make it easier, um, for example. Um, but they run the, they run the C code. When they go to take the C, they're going to have to translate it into bytecode for the for the the CPU, right? Um, for the kernel, and they are going to um, do that with a just-in-time compiler that does a whole bunch of checking. It looks for branching conditions, it looks for loop conditions, it looks for depth of commands, so that we don't have these race conditions that can lock up the kernel. And then these things run in the sandbox environment, so they're very well protected. The issue with eBPF is it only works on newer kernels, right? Um, 5.x and above, more or less. Um, and so if you're running an older kernel, you can't necessarily run eBPF, right? And so um, that is, you know, it's if you can run it, it's the way to go, right? And we have a modern eBPF probe um, that if your system can do it, we will install it for you automatically. You don't have to worry about it. It ships with Falco. Right. So we have a classic eBPF probe and that's sort of sort of a hybrid between like a kernel module and, and it's managed sort of the way kernel modules are managed and the modern eBPF probe, which is actually more automated and it needs an even newer kernel, um, 5.18, I think. So that's what eBPF is. So that's how the kernel gets communicated with. Right. So eBPF is an easier way to instrument your kernels. Right. So we talked about that. You don't want to see a message that says user 1312467 open uh file descriptor three. And you want to you want a nice message. Well, getting that nice message is actually more complicated than you might think. So that's where the process of enrichment comes in. So if you think about how files are represented in the Linux file system. And in Linux, everything is a file, they say, but this is actually like real, I'm talking about actual file files, like, you know, text files or whatever. Um, when I go to open a file, I'll say open Etsy hosts, right? That'll be the system call. And what that system call will return is a file descriptor. And that file descriptor is an arbitrary number, right? So in our case, 
let's say it's file descriptor two, right? And um, and when we do that, when we open the file, the file descriptors are going to be matched up to a file table that tells you the permissions for which that file. Was. So when you open it, like open it read only, open it read write, whatever, right? And so we're gonna we're gonna open the we're gonna open the system up, and we're gonna open the file up, and we're gonna on the file table we're gonna say it's got read permissions, and then we're gonna come over and we're gonna have something called an inode table, and that's where the actual file name exists. On subsequent uh, syscalls about the file, we do not use the file name. We use the file descriptor, right? So, so we do an open Etsy host, and then we do a read on two, right? So we say read two, right? And it puts it into a buffer, and then you know you can do whatever you need to do with it. We don't ever use the file name again. And then when we close it, we close two, right? And then we go through and we clean up all of this stuff that's happening, right? So if I capture a system call on a write event and all I have is the file descriptor, I would have to go through these these in, these um, on disk uh, information stores here, these on disk tables to figure out what the file name was so I could give that to you. But rather than do that, what we do with Falco is we do something called a state table. And a state table is, con is um is uh, constructed dynamically by Falco. Falco has two libraries, one that runs at startup and one that runs constantly. These two libraries build the um, state table. And they basically say, okay, well, um, when I first start at Falco, what are all the processes that are running? What's all the file descriptors? What's all this? Let me build the initial version of the state table. So if if a file was already open, right, we would we would we would capture that in this initial setup phase. If a file wasn't open and Falco was running, whenever I saw that open system call, I would build a state table, right? I would be like, okay, well, for process ID 475, which, which was cat, John was looking at this file Etsy host and that ended up with file descriptor four. Now we hold all of this in memory. So when we say file descriptor four, all we have to do is run to the state table and pull it out of memory real fast. We don't have to pull it off the disk. And all this gets dynamically updated uh, in real time. So that's the enrichment process. On the rule side, on the on the matching, um, we ship with over 80 default rules. Um, you can take those rules, you can modify them, you can um, you can modify the rules, you can enable them, you can disable them, you can create your own, you can remove them, fully functional, but we have about 80 rules. Now, in the version of Falco that we just released, um, like two days ago, we've done a, a, a change to Falco rules, right? So we used to have all 80 rules in one file. And I haven't updated the slides because this literally just changed. Now what we're doing is we have, and one of the complaints that people had about Falco was that Falco can be noisy, right? With so many rules and so many system calls, you might be getting a lot of information. And so what we what we've done is we've said, okay, look, here's this this is the stable rules, and these provide you a good baseline set of functionality, right? So it's no longer eighty. I wish I don't know the exact number. I could go look in the repo and find out, but we have now have the stable rules, and then we are going to have incubating rules and sandbox rules. And incubating rules are rules that are more aimed at specialized use cases, so they they aren't they aren't as generally applicable, right? So and then we're gonna have incubating rules, which we consider to be experimental. If you need those other rules, they're available to you. You can load them up if you want them, but by default, we're gonna load a subset of the 80 rules to try to make your environment, to find the balance between you know, good, secure coverage and less noise that you have to sift through. Um, a rule has actually, I keep meaning to do this. I'm gonna do it right now because I keep meaning to do it and I don't do it. And then every class has to watch me do this. Okay, there you go. Thank you for bearing with me while I do that. Um, I won't update the next slide while we're here, but we'll just live with it. Okay, so Falco rules, they have a rule field, which is the name of the rule, a description, which is what you see on the screen describing what happened, then they have a condition. Every Falco rule is a Boolean set of conditions. Did a, spawn, did a process spawn? 
Was that process in a container and was that process a shell? Spawn process and container and pro shell prox. If all of those are true, because with ands, they all have to be true, then we are going to write an output. And these are the these fields here, like user.name, user.login UID, those are the enrichment fields. Those are going to get pulled out of the state table whenever we build this output message. So we'll go through and we like, go to the state table, tell me the username for this. Go to the state table, and tell me the login ID. So that is the output message that will get written. And then this, uh, you can have warning, you can have critical, you can have notice, you can have error, those show up. And then you can also tag all your output um, and rules and output um, with user defined tags to make them easier to sort, to enable, you can enable them or disable them and mass using tags, however you want to do that. So that's the construction of a Falco rule. Um, but you'll notice like this idea here of like spawn process and container and shell procs, what does that actually mean? Well, we're using something called lists and macros to do that, right? And so a macro is just a way of writing a statement um, and making it reusable. It's like a, a function or a subroutine in an application, right? So I'm just going to basically, shell procs means that the process name was in shell binaries. Well, what shell binaries? Well, shell binaries is an array. It's a list, right? So, so rather than writing, you know, it, rather than saying if the process, if process name equals ash or at bash or C shell or corn shell or SH, right? You just say, if it's in this array, just, look it up. Um, that allows you to reuse those arrays for other things, right? Container means the container ID wasn't host. That's how we know we're running in a container. And then if we were running, uh, if we see, capture a system call that is exec VE uh, or exec VE at, then we know that we're somebody has started something up and make sure it's not running in the Falco directory, make sure it's running outside and then we're great. Okay, so that's what these are. Lists and macros basically allow you to reuse your code and have your code be much more succinct and much more readable. Um, so that's what you get out of macros and lists. They're incredibly powerful. You know, for instance, if somebody created a new shell, we'll call it Mike shell, we could go in, right? We could add Mike shell to the shell binaries and everywhere that this list item is used is automatically updated. Way, way easier to manage your rules using lists and macros. All right, so we are on to lab number two. Let's check the chat. Uh, does, uh, um, well, there we go. Um, yeah, so Sridhar was asking, hey, isn't it going to be noisy as it checks the system calls? Yes, that's that's why one of the reasons we called the, we try to reduce the number of default rules. Um, does, how does, um, does Falco use AI to detect anomalies? No, we use rule matching. We you, we look at we look at system calls against rules. Um, there's no AI involved there. Now there is a project that's been kicked off called Falco GPT, which can use AI to suggest remediation for your rules, right? But not to detect them. The detection is system calls against rules. There's no AI there. Um, does Falco apply for containers that just have a single binary? So. It, it doesn't matter where the application is being executed because we don't care. What we care about are system calls, right? So in the case of containers, right? Remember back when I said containers are just isolated Linux processes? Every, every system call coming out of a container gets routed into the, the kernel of the underlying system. So we just capture it with a kernel driver. So in an environment like Kubernetes, we're running the Falco, um, the Falco, uh, executable as a daemon set on the Kubernetes cluster, but we're running the driver on the underlying host. And that underlying host is where all the system calls get routed through. So it doesn't even, it doesn't matter if the container has one binary or, um, or a man, a many binaries because containers are writing all of their system calls to the underlying kernel. And that's what we instrumented. And then that gets written back up into the Falco, um, the Falco container that's running up there to process things. And that's why that container needs to be privileged is to be able to read those things. All right, so let's do the next lab. Um, all right, ah, oh, man. Oh, I did do it, okay. So close this out. So we talked about the rules. Um, rules are held up in here, up in the rules directory. And as I mentioned before, so here's the Falco rules. 
here's the sandbox rules, here's the incubating rules, right? So we now have, so there's 1,254 lines in the incubating rules. There's 1,700 lines in the, um, in the uh, sandbox rules. And then in the default rules, there's 1,245. So you can see been called down quite a bit. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do here is we are going to, in this thing, we're just going to follow the logs. So this is just telling me, hey, give me all the logs since uh, right now and put them on the screen as things happen. And then I'm going to go into this tab and I'm going to run some attacks. So this is decidedly not exciting, this part. So we're performing the attack and the attack is done. So now if we go over to the shell, we'll see here's what happened. Now, I'm gonna pause for about 30 seconds. And so you can read this message if you if you haven't already read it um, and try to suss out what's going on and then I'll, I'll tell you. So um, give you about 30 seconds here and then I'll, I'll go in and describe it. Okay, so, you know, I, I when I do these workshops live, I say, what happened? And someone says, a sensitive file was open for reading by a non-trusted program? Well, absolutely, right? But the question then is, well, what's what file was opened? So if we go through here, we can see this thing here says file Etsy shadow, right? So that's probably the file that got opened. But how did it get opened? Huh. Well, it looks like they ran something called G-Unicorn. G-Unicorn is a web services gateway interface. It's a web server, essentially, for uh, Python, right? So it's used to run Python applications or, you know, uh, web, web, web-based Python applications. And so, okay, so they ran G-Unicorn. What did they, well, what was the command? Well, they ran G-Unicorn, use the local bin G-Unicorn, two workers, four threads, and access the log file, error log file, and then they ran app.app, .app, right? That's the app they ran. So that is the actual um, error. I mean, that's the actual app that's trying to read the file. So if you were going to try to remediate this, you'd have to understand, well, what you do is, as somebody who's doing security, what you would do is you would go to the author of that um, assuming this was a real program in your environment, right? And somebody was supposed to run this, you'd go back to them and be like, why are you reading the Etsy shadow file? And they'd be like, oh, um, because X, Y, Z, or, oh, I didn't know I was. And then you would either fix that or you would go in and update your rules so that you didn't get this message anymore for that particular application, right? So it either shouldn't be happening and you need to fix it, or you need to like, it should be happening and you just want to turn the warning off. Um, so which command triggered that? We explained that. What rule was triggered? Um, sensitive file being open for read. Is there a macro or list? Yeah, there is a macro for sensitive files. So if I go, um, sensitive file, read sensitive file, um, right? Sensitive file open for reading. This is by a trusted program, untrusted program, the same thing. If we look for sensitive, underscore files, you can see that that's the macro and sensitive files, uh, anything that starts with Etsy um, or, or if it's in sensitive file names or um, directory is in uh, sudoers directory or pam.directory, this is our thing. So we also have another list here, sensitive file names, where we can go in and um, sensitive file names is, oh, sorry, that's not it. Sense of file names are right here. Is a list for Etsy Shadow, Etsy Sudoers, Etsy Pam.com, Etsy Security, PWQuality.com. So if you have other sensitive files, you could put them in there as well, right? Um, all right, cool. All right. So that is that attack. Let's go ahead and do this, the next one.
and it's done. And so what we care about here is this. So let's give it a couple seconds and then we'll talk about what's happening. Okay, all right, so error package management process launched in a container. Okay, that's what happened, right? So the user, the U, root user ran APK add, right? APK is a package manager um, and they installed Nmap and SS, OpenSSH. This would be something you'd wanna look into, right? Um, OpenSSH would allow people to instantiate connections into the container and map would allow them to probe and look at systems. Um, neither one of these things should be being added. Well, first of all, you should not be running a package manager in a running container. You shouldn't be doing that. That should not happen, right? That's a, what I call an operational anti-pattern. We do not update running containers, right? And even if you do, you probably shouldn't be installing Nmap or OpenSSH. So that was the um, that was the issue, right? Um, I'm not going to get into the rule stuff. If you're interested in finding out the macros that were involved, there is a there is a list involved, right? Um, and there is a macro involved, but you can look those up on your own. Um, and would this rule trigger if the if the it was run on the host? Well, the answer to that is no, because it's specifically looking for containers. And so part of the rule is probably container does not equal host, right? Um, that way we know it's in a container. So, all right. So this last one we're going to do. All right. Attack three. And we'll go in here. And this is actually two things, right? There's two things going on here. There's this one and the one below it. So I'm going to give you, and I will tell you, nobody has ever explained how we know what is going on in attack three, how we know the second one. Um, so in the first one, I hope you had some time to look at it. What's happening here? is that somebody is going in and they're trying to fool you by renaming one application into an application that you are probably not too worried about, right? So what we're doing is we're saying, hey, take this, run a shell and run, move Nmap to user bin app, right? So just go ahead and run that, just run, just like rename it that way, because if somebody's looking for Nmap running, if someone's looking for that executable, right? Because we would, you know, like we showed in earlier, there's a rule about Netcat, right? If there's a rule that says don't run Nmap or let us know, well, I'm going to try to hide Nmap. I'm going to run it as app. And then I'm going to run it um, and I'm going to run it and try to scan this app DB application, right? Well, that's not good. But maybe you wouldn't know because it's not Nmap running, it's app running. So this is like, hey, somebody ran and renamed a file and they took and they renamed this file and you should be aware of it, right? Okay, so that's the first That's the first thing that you'd be like, wait a minute, why are people renaming files inside of containers? That's weird. But this one, executing a binary not part of the base image, right? So this is... Another case where somebody ran um, that same command, but they're trying to do it with gunicorn, right? So they gunicorn is firing off um, this app thing, right? So um, command app app, you know, support scan app um, port scan this this app DB thing, right? So app was started with gunicorn. Somebody's trying to port scan it, port scan this app DV, and we're saying, look, this app, this this app that they're running here, command app, 
that this application right here is not part of the base image. It's not part of the base image of the container. It was added to the container. How do we know that? Does anybody have any idea how we would know that? And now I've given I've given this workshop now in four countries to many, many, many people, and nobody has ever gotten this. And I didn't get it either. I had to go ask, and I should have gotten it. Oh, two people. Let's see. Do we? It was a different inode. I mean, nope. There's so we are not doing any inventories. Right. We don't maintain an inventory of of uh, when we don't have access to the S bomb. We would like to do stuff with SBOM. So um, SBOM is the software bill of materials, right? It's how our applications are constructed. It's not that, and it's not that it's a different inode. Um, although both of those would be kind of interesting, but it would require us to like maintain a bunch of state we don't. The question is, how do we know that this, this uh, application that we're executing is not part of the base image? So, um, because we're, we want to get done on time here. Um, I will start explaining it. And if you figure it out by the way I'm explaining it, um, shout out. Um, it's not size difference of the image. It is, yes, Matthias got it. He's the only person that's ever answered this correctly. And I'm gonna assume he got it. And if I didn't, then you have to be honest because I'll explain it for other people. But you, Matthias, Matthias, or Matthias, I'm not sure how some people pronounce it differently, but yes. So container images, are a bunch of layers, right? So if you have a container image, um, there's going to be a base layer, which is the, the operating system kernel. And then there's going to be a layer where you add in your application or maybe you installed some libraries and a layer where you copy in your application code and a layer where you tell every what to run and blah, blah, blah. So the only difference between an image and a running container is that in an image, every layer is read only. But when you instantiate a running container, you add a run, you add a read write layer to the top. And anything that changes in the in the container gets written into that top layer. So if I was to add a new file, that file would be in the uppermost layer because it's not in um <laughs> uh, maybe he has a ten of the workshop. Because it's in the uppermost layer, we know that it wasn't part of the base image. And if you look at the XE flags here, I'm going to close the chat. Um, it tells us that it was executed from the upper layer. I don't do this as a exercise in trivia. I do this as an exercise in when you start thinking about things that you want to detect, you may have to get really creative in how you detect them. So we want to know if somebody runs something that wasn't part of a base image. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, do we have an inventory of all the stuff that they started? No. Do we? Can we compare file sizes? No. Can we do this? Can we do that? No. Well, what we can do is we can tell when something was executed in a container at the topmost layer. Um, but this would not work on a host, right? It would only do it in a container. Um, but the rule only applies to containers. All right. Congratulations. Nice job. Um, okay, cool. That's, uh, let's go back to our slides because that's the last part of the slab. All right. So slideshow, and we're actually doing pretty good on time. Um, actually, let's go, let's, because we're doing good on time, let's go ahead and take, we've been at this now for an hour and a half. Let's take a nine minute break. So 30 minutes past the hour, I will resume um, our discussion. And so go ahead and take a nine minute break, get a cup of coffee or a tea or a chai. Well, chai is tea. Like in America, they order chai tea, which is like literally ordering tea tea. Um, so go get a drink or whatever, uh, whatever you need to do. And we will reconvene in nine minutes. Um, I'm going to step away for a second, but then we'll come back. And if there are other questions, um, I didn't necessarily want to stop sharing. Um, what I wanted to do, um, share, what I want to do is I wanted to escape out of this. Um, if you have any more questions, put them in the chat um, uh, and I will try to answer them. But otherwise, um, I'll see everybody here in a uh, in in uh, nine minutes. <laughs>
Alrighty, we're back. Hey, so, um, all right, let's jump back into it. Uh, move the chat. Okay, so we um, have been looking at log files to examine Falco output. And I mentioned earlier that we actually have a utility could do that. It's called Falco Sidekick UI. So, right, we've been looking at system calls, and I did mention that we have plugins. We're not going to do anything with plugins in this lab, um, but that, you know, so we know that we can augment the input, right, with plugins uh, to uh, augment system calls. Um, then for the output, we can actually use something called Falco Sidekick. And Falco Sidekick allows you to send output uh, either generically or selectively to different endpoints. And it's a way, you know, someone asks, hey, is this detection a response? And by default, it's not. But what Sidekick allows you to do is integrate um, the detection capabilities of Falco with the systems that you're already using, right? So what we're finding is that most people already have something set up. Right, they already have an uh, SAM set up, or they've got you know some sort of logging set up, or whatever it is. Um, so they don't want to reinvent that wheel. They want to connect that up with Falco, and that's what Sidekick lets us do. So um, with Sidekick, you can send the output out to um, you know communications programs, chat programs like Slack or Discord or Teams or Google Meet. You can write it into Elastic Logs or logs up on you know uh, on on AWS. Um, you can send it into message queues so that it can be, you know, can be uh, queued and then processed by whatever application is reading from that queue. Um, you can send it out to functions as a service platforms like OpenFAS or Lambda or Knative so that you can um, process, uh, you kick off some sort of process on that, um, right? You can also kick off CICD pipelines with that. Um, you can send it out to like, uh, you know, uh, Argo or, or uh, Tekton or something like that. Um, you can write it out to, you know, some of these platforms for, for gathering metrics, Prometheus, Grafana, Datadog, right? Um, you can use PagerDuty to alert, for instance, or you can just write it out to a storage bucket. There's a lot more, but the idea is you can take that data and do with it what makes the most sense for your environment, right? And so whether that's just archiving it or if it's taking some action or if it's letting somebody know, right? That's kind of what you do. Um, so, so on that sort of like, well, what, what would it look like? What might it look like if I was going to try to, to do some sort of response? So for instance, let's say we had that, um, event where somebody renamed the file, right? So we get that alert and we get that notification. We can send that up to Lambda and we can look at it and go, okay, we got this alert. They're trying to read, they just installed something into the file. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to assign a label to that pod, right? So in Kubernetes, you can uh, uh, arbitrarily assign labels and then labels can be used to place resources, run, you know, do different things. So we could, we could, we could place a label on this pod that would cause the, the, the uh, scheduler to take it out of commission. Right. And then, Kubernetes would just replace it with a good one. So somebody did something in this container. I'm not sure exactly what they did, but I want to look at it. So I'm going to relabel it, pull it out of commission so it's not a, a, a vector any longer, right? A, a place where somebody could maybe be launching an attack. Um, and I'm going to, you know, remove it out of the, the, the application, but I want to save it off somewhere. So I could do that with a Lambda function, and it would not actually be that hard to do. And then, you know, that, you know, if it was Lambda, obviously it's going to be running on AWS, but if it was OpenFast, it could be running on any of these platforms or Knative or, you know, or you do it in Google Cloud Functions or Azure Functions or whatever you want to do it in, right? So any of those things could be done. Also, you know, as I mentioned, you could use um, something like Argo or Tekton to just rebuild it, right? So, oh, so this was compromised. I'm rebuilding the whole image, right? We discovered that there was a vulnerability later, right? And we're going to rebuild everything. We're going to do that based on you know, based on this notification. So that, you know, it's not, um, it's not, you know, something we do natively. It's something we give you the tools to do because we realize that most people are going to want to integrate it into an existing system rather than, you know, um, just try to have us, you know, duplicate functionality they already have. So Sidekick can be installed on its own. It gets installed the same way that we installed Falco in the first lab where you go in and, 
add the the chart to the repo the, uh, you know add the the chart to the repository and update it and um and then you install it and you just say um you know install falco sidekick um or you can install it with falco um, when you do the install time by giving it um, falco sidekick enabled equals true and falco sidekick web ui enabled equals true sidekick is two components the first is that sort of um communications bus, right? The thing that can route events out to different endpoints. And then the second part is a web UI where you can look at some things, right? It's not super sophisticated, but you can in fact do it. So um, you know what, I'm gonna do something real fast because I forgot to do it in the last one. So we're gonna, I'll finish up my slides here in a second. I just wanted to get that loading so we can move right into it. Um, okay. Um, Slideshow. So either install it standalone or install it with Falco. Um, there's another tool that we're going to use in this lab that a lot of people um, are like, well, how do I know if my rule sets are working? How do I know if um, um, all of the stuff is, is, you know, is Falco installed correctly? Is it picking up the things I care about? Right. So we have this thing called event generator and it basically randomly goes out and does suspect actions um, on a system. Now, it's going to do things you, that you probably wouldn't want done on a production system, right? So run it in a container, right? Run it, um, you know, run it somewhere where it's not gonna mess things up. Just let it do its thing, um, right? Uh, do not run it on a production system. Run it in a sandbox, right? Um, so that, you know, don't run it just on the host, run it somewhere where it's kind of some, got some boundaries around it, which is what you'll do in the lab, right? So yeah, with that, let's go into the last lab. This last lab is about um, Sidekick. Um, it'll be starting here in a second. Um, and uh, it'll start right now. So what we're going to do in this lab is we're going to install Sidekick. We're going to when we install it, we're going to connect it to a Slack webhook so that our notifications go to a Slack channel. And then we are going to uh, do some attacks um, and you'll see that message show up in Slack. And we'll also look at that message in the Sidekick UI. So we're going to go in here and we're going to, um, yeah, first thing we're going to do is we're going to upgrade Falco to have Sidekick. And if you're doing this on your own, make sure you change this last part here at the end so that you can find your messages more easily in the Slack channel. We have one Slack channel we use for all our workshops. There's a bunch of notifications in there. By using this custom field, I can search on my name and I'll find my notifications. So put whatever you want in there. Um, so we'll go ahead and do that. And now we're going to do a kubectl get pods in the Falco namespace. And what it should say is that Falco is restarting itself um, and that Sidekick is starting up. So Sidekick has uh, four containers of, uh, it's got two containers for Sidekick, two or two, two pods for Sidekick. It's got two pods for um, uh, the Sidekick UI, and then it has a single pod for Redis. So those are going to be coming up here uh, shortly. So the sidekick is up. Falco is initializing. Um, we're still waiting for the UI Redis server to come up. So it'll be just a second. Uh, I didn't want to do that. Dang it. Too fast. Okay, well... Um, we are still waiting for Sidekick UI to come up. So we'll give that a couple more seconds. All right, looks good. Looks like we should be able to work with this. So um, because what we need to do is we have to do, this is a weird cat, uh, thing. You don't do this in production. Um, this is basically just a redirection um, of the Sidekick uh, UI uh, running on the local system here into a, an uh, internet-facing um, 
Uh, it's a port forward. I'm port forwarding is what I'm doing is the easier way to say it. So we're going to do that. And now um, we should be able to see. Yeah, there it is. And I'll log in. We'll log in. All right. So I know it's an insecure password. We're not going to worry about that right now. Okay. So that is all working the way we'd expect it to. So let's go ahead and test it. Um, we're going to shell into the container. And if I go into the Falco Psychic UI, we should see, right? We've got a notification. It was coming from the system calls. It had these tags on it, right? One rule has been violated. And if I come into events, we can get the, uh, let me close this. If I, it's such a pain if I close that though. I'll just shrink it a little bit. You can say a shell was spawned in a container, right? And then all of that stuff is neatly with all the flags neatly laid out for you. I had that blown up pretty big. That's part of the problem. Um, so yeah, there's the, there's that event, right? So we know that that is working well. So let's go ahead and get out of this. And then we're going to go into acid burn. Oh. Performing the attack. And then um, we're going to go in. So if we go into Falco Sidekick UI, um, right, we see a lot more, right? We see the modified binaries and we see um, executing not part of a base image. So we see those two errors. It's the same, it's the same attack we ran before. So now we see that showing up here. And then if I go over here to my Slack and I search for myself, I just want to make sure I refresh it. And then, so September 28th, right? That's today. Here is the critical. And we're only doing this. Um, one thing I didn't show is we're only doing this for critical notifications. So the critical notification shows up. So if I go back, where I want to go? Here? Yeah. I want to go here. And I want to go, and I want to look at this command here, right? Um, set Falco Psychic, minimum priority critical, right? And so that's why when we go to Slack, we only see one notification, right? And it's for that critical uh, exception. Um, and then the other thing too is this is how we're communicating with Slack. We're just putting in a webhook. You remember how I mentioned like in the beginning, this idea of the, the perimeter and people always looking for stuff and always looking for ways to to like, you know, is there an opening here? Th that's used for good and it's used, and there's people doing that for good and evil, right? Like, so on the good side, uh, I was writing some documentation for Falco and I was writing this, I was putting this same exercise into our documentation, which is held in GitHub in a public repo because we're an open source project. And so I put the Slack webhook in the GitHub repo and apparently Slack is scanning public GitHub repos looking for webhooks because three hours after I put it in there, Slack had invalidated the webhook and sent us an email saying, you put a webhook in a public repository, don't do that. And we had to reissue the webhook. Um, this class, the class materials aren't in a public repository. That's why we can do it that way. Um, we just had to work around that in the, in the documentation. So that's just another example of like this idea that there is no perimeter, right? People and and anybody could be looking for your stuff for any number of reasons. All right. So yeah, I think that is oh event generator. So let's go in and run that. So let's control C this. We'll clear this and we'll pass that in. All right. And so it's going to pull the container down. And it's going to sleep for five seconds. And then it's going to go in. It's going to do um, some other stuff. And then when we go in, right below the database. So if we come in now to, um, um, sorry, Sidekick over here, we should start seeing more of these events coming in, right? So this came in at 1044.50, which is right now, right? So these are being called by you know, someone's found a database, right? 
someone wrote below a monitor directory. So all of these are now being spawned in by event generator. So we can start seeing the framework picking things up, the number of rules that were, you know, they were all notices or whatever um, coming in. Anyway, so um, yeah, so that's event generator. So it's a good tool for you to have in your toolbox. Uh, nothing in the chat. So let's go back to the slides. Um, I did want to save a few. Oh, dang it. Why did I do that again? Um, I did want to save a few minutes for questions. What I wanted to do was hit this button here, not that button. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, we did the lab. So closing remarks. So, right, we are in a we're in a brave new world, right? And and it's not like the cloud is new. It's been a thing for the last you know really hardcore last decade or so, right? And so, but we've had to evolve. You know, the cloud ushered in a whole new area of application architectures, and there was also this idea of containers and microservices, and all these things mean that what you used to do in as much as guarding the perimeter doesn't work anymore. And, you, and you've and you got to be, you got to move from like detection intrusion to activity de detection, right? When are people doing things that are weird? And it may not be the, you know, it may not be that, um, it may not be that what they're doing is nefarious, but you definitely want to be aware of it, right? So we move from that to that, um, you know, Falco, we're going to pull events out of the kernel using some sort of kernel driver, either an EBPF probe or a loadable kernel module. We're going to write those to a ring buffer. We're going to pull them into Falco. We're going to parse through them. We're going to match them to a rule potentially, and then we're going to enrich the output and send it to you, right? Be a bunch of standard standard methods. Um, Falco rules. Uh, these are always going to be Boolean conditions. They can use lists and macros to be able to... Um, to help understand how, uh, you know, to understand or to simplify your your rules file to make them easier to read and uh, more maintainable. So that's Falco rules. And then it's not, you know, at its most basic level, Falco does detection and will write stuff into your log files for you. However, you know, it'll, it'll take system calls, right? You, run detection on them and write them into your log files. You can augment that with plugins. These plugins are all open source. So if you're saying, well, I'm on Azure, you know, we don't have a plugin. It's like, well, write one, right? We'll help you go to meet us on the Falco Slack channel on Kubernetes Slack, and we'll help you write these plugins. Um, I'm doing a, me and my coworker, my colleague Toma and I are doing a session on um, um, plugins um, over at uh, KubeCon. So, all right, so, and then um, with Sidekick, you can write that information out. And Sidekick was actually written by my colleague, Toma, the person I was just mentioning. So, um, yeah, that's the ecosystem. The um, There's a great book, Practical Cloud Native Security with Falco from O'Reilly. It's awesome. Up on falco.org, we've got documentation, we've got training. Um, we've been adding videos to YouTube. So our video, our YouTube playlist is growing. Um, there's a webinar that I did last week. Um, from the CNCF that's available on YouTube now, um, finding five famous or detecting five famous exploits with Falco that where we go in and we look at Log4j, Neo4j, uh, Apache tra path traversal, um, web logic, auth uh, authentication bypass, along with, um, uh, um, I don't know, I, I, can't, I can't, the ability to run stuff, right? Remote, remote code execution. Right, so we look at web logic, and then we also look at. There's a fifth one I can't remember what it is off the top of my head, but those are four of them. That's up on YouTube too. If you just Google CNCF Falco, you'll probably find it. Um, all right, let's go here. Uh, can you share this deck of recording? That um, the recording will be sh uh, shared by AI Camp, and if I go to um, that, is a link to the slides right there. This will be compared with Waza, which helps detect the security issues. And um, I don't know enough about Waza to compare them, unfortunately. Uh, so I can't really speak to that. If you know what Waza does, hopefully you understand what what Falco does, and you can compare them. I don't know that myself. So, um, so yeah, there's the slides. Um, I will put that in the chat. Hold on, let me go here, and I'll put that in the chat. And then I'll also put this in the chat. If you could 
fill this out. I would appreciate it. Helps us make. And yes, feel free to say that I speak too fast because even though I know that I do it, I sometimes have a hard time not doing it. Um, all right. Well, with that, um, if there are no further questions, I guess we'll wrap up a few minutes early. Um, ah, well, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, thanks for attending, everybody. Um, you can find me. I am, I'll put it uh, on Twitter, everywhere else in the world. I am at Mike G. Coleman. So hit me up on LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever else. Um, thanks for attending and have a great rest of your day. And as we head into the weekend, I hope you all has a nice weekend. Okay. Thank you so much, Mike, for the session. Do we have any more questions?